Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're pleased to have with us today, Marika Brousseau. Marika, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Now, Marika, for those of listeners who don't know your name, you are a third-generation Scientologist. That's correct. And the daughter of Hayden and Lucy James. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother was an OT4. Mm -hmm. So you were born into the Church of Scientology. Yes, that's right. Uh, I was born and my mother and my biological father were on staff at the Davis Mission. And when I was two years old, my mother joined the Sea Org. Although my childhood, you know, wasn't what I wanted it to be and it wasn't what I envisioned it should be, it was a heck of a lot better than hundreds of other children had it. So when you listen to my story, I want you to realize that this is one of the 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 best Sea Org childhoods you're going to hear about. Marika, before the show, you were telling me a story, and this could really set the tone for the interview. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Tell our listeners the story about how you were a tiny child and the oranges that they serve. Right. This really is <laughs> illustrative. Yeah, this is Talk one of my first uh, memories, actually, was the playground at the CEO. And, you know, these hundreds of children, they'll remember this playground because that's where you spent the majority of your time. Um, most of the daytime was, was outside on that concrete playground. So those are the, the earliest memories for me. Now, <clears throat> uh, we ate in the... Uh, there was sort of a, a dining hall in the building, but at break time, you know, it would get really hot out in the playground. Uh, you weren't allowed to go in and get a snack or have a drink of water. Uh, they would bring a snack out to you. So at a certain time of day, you know, you're really hot, really sweaty. You know what it's like Oh sure. Yeah, in LA in the summertime. So they would bring, two nannies would bring out uh, folding tables and open them up and put the oranges. They were quarters, quarters of oranges, a couple of big bowls of them. Now, as soon as we saw the nannies, we would start running in their direction. So you'd have a horde of a couple of hundred children running in one direction at two nannies. And it was just a fight to get in there and grab your oranges and get away and eat them as fast as you could before anyone took them from you. There was no nanny that would ensure you got your orange and that you got a drink of water. You had to make sure that you did. You know, two nannies could not ensure that a couple hundred children got their snack. Marika, that is just you know, so you have you have uh, almost like Lord of the Flies children. Yes. So the big the big you were a tiny little girl, mm -hmm. and the big children would shove you out of the way. Mm, completely, it was like the Hunger Games. You know, the Hunger Games is a very good metaphor for the Church of Scientology. So you have uh, people competing like that, mm. and I, and I just got to tell you, you know, this is so your kids fighting for oranges, right? Mm -hmm. This is so evocative of musical chairs of adults fighting for the chairs. Oh, very much so. I mean, it felt like you were fighting for your survival because you're so thirsty. You, you're so hot. Um, you're not going to be allowed inside to cool off, to get a drink. So this is your only chance. And you have bigger children who, you know, they want their share too. And there's no management of the food. There's no orderly line. But why were there only two nannies to supervise a few hundred kids? Couldn't they get a few more child care people? I think not. Uh, I mean, at the best of times, the Sea Org was stretched for staff. And that was a huge problem, was recruitment. How do you get enough people to fill these posts? Well, it, do, you think it, mm -hmm. do you think it's correct to say that child care was viewed as one of the lowest rungs on the totem pole? It's one of the worst things you could do in Sea Org? Um, I don't know about one of the worst things that you could do necessarily, but um, they put the least wanted people um, as staff of the CEO. 
Wow, that doesn't say very much at all. No. And it's different. You know, it was, it was definitely different for the CMO nursery, which is... Now, now, what does that mean, CMO? So it's the Commodore's Messenger Org nursery. So if one of your parents... Uh, if one of your parents was a member of the Commodore's Messenger Org or, you know, a higher organization, always with the hierarchy, the Church of Scientology is constantly has to have a hierarchy for some reason. Um, but yes, if you're privileged enough um, to be in CMO or above, and if you have a child who's young enough, they can go into this CMO nursery. So that was different. The CMO nursery staff were chosen with care. And the differences are inside the, the CEO building at the back of CC Inn um, in LA. There were about, I mean, if I can give you some numbers. So you've got about 400 children in one building. Um, and there's about, I would say average, uh, one nanny, to about two dozen children. Now, this changed um, for babies, you know, for infants, there was about one nanny to eight infants. Say, you know, take a group of three-year-olds. There's one nanny to 18 three-year-olds. That's just not even practical. I mean, it, how can one person handle 18 three-year-olds? They can't. Therefore, yeah. you have these feral children well, what's what's a typical day in the life of a child? You get up at 6 a.m.? I don't think it's that early. We don't live in that actual building. Um, we live in buildings in Hollywood. There was, um, so there's Leb Hall, there was the Fountain Building, the Anthony Building, later the Edgemont Building. So there were a couple of buildings um, that the Sea Org members lived with, with their children, and they were set up um, typically... They were one or two bedroom apartments. Uh, for instance, um, I had my room, my parents slept in what would have been the living room, and then I had the bedroom. So your parents would get up and take you to basically childcare and drop you off? Yes, well, outside of our buildings, there would be a bus that would take us there. So my mom would put me on the bus every day. And then, you, and then the evening when you got home, was your mom there? Well, it didn't quite happen that way. Um, the evenings in the CEO, they would bring the cots out at night. Um, so say for instance, okay, my class, I had, a, I had a nanny called Denise and she was lovely. And I, I was lucky because she liked me. So in her class, you know, uh, we were pretty much there all day. We were either in that one room or we were out in the playground. Um, and at the end of the day, the cots would be brought out. So say about two dozen cots and they'd, they'd be laid out and you lay down on your cot and you go to sleep. And that was nighttime. And then anywhere, and that was probably, you know, 7 p.m., 7, 8, depending on age. And then anywhere from 10, 11 p.m. onwards, you're parents would come and pick you up or a parent would come and pick you up and then you would be taken um, you, you would you know walk home with them or I guess if they had a car you'd drive home but um, that's how it would work um, every day you know you had a scenario where I don't feel like it was very safe for children to be sleeping there at night because they weren't supervised either it's not like the nanny then stayed in that room all night with you and made sure that you got picked up by the right parent. They didn't do that. As soon as everybody was asleep, they would, they would have, you know, one lady on a reception. And sometimes I saw a security guard once or twice, but that was really about it. There, like I say, there was no one in the room, no, no adult in the room, and parents would come, you know, typically work that, you know, my mom would come over, shake me. I'd wake up, realize where I am. Oh, okay, it's time to go home. She'd pick me up. We'd walk out of the building, walk home. One thing you said before the show that I think is very important, 
And this is something I, I really want people to understand. Mm. You know, parents aren't to blame in the sewer culture. No, not at all. And and explain what you meant by that, because I don't, I don't. It's hard for people who've never been in to understand. Right. Well, the conception generally is is that oh, these must be terrible parents to allow their children to grow up that way. And it's not true. These parents are lied to. They don't get told how it's going to be. They get told, you know, this is excellent child care, um, you know, uh, yeah, excellent child care. You're going to, there's family time. You know, you'll see your child for a couple of hours a day and it's quality time and um, you'll get a day off with them every couple of weeks. You're not told the conditions. You're not shown the birthing. You don't know until you join. And parents are not allowed to be parents. Children are not allowed to be children. You know, that's, a, that's probably the most striking thing I've ever heard. Parents are not allowed to be parents. Children are not allowed to be children. Right. The Sea Org will say or do anything to recruit people into it. Yes. Look, I know, I know the guy who was on the recruitment cycle for Tommy Davis. Hmm. And uh, John Peeler was one of the guys on the recruitment cycle. And I don't think John feels good about it, but, I mean, Tommy Davis gave up going to college, and, you know, he had gone into college he wanted mm. with his parents' wealth. But really what John shared with me was heartbreaking. The Sea Org has quotas, and they will say anything to get parents into the Sea Organization. Yeah, they're incredibly desperate. And that's what happened to my mom. You know, originally, when she joined, I mean, there was no way that she was going to let me go to the CEO. She'd seen the conditions. There was absolutely no way. But where she joined at Incom, they had their own little private nursery, and it was only a couple of kids. So she didn't feel it was that bad. You know, it was, it was a nice nursery. No, and you would, not if it was just a few children. Right, and that was fine. But then she's not there for long, and next thing you know, I'm in the CEO. And once you're in the Sea Org, you have a heck of a time getting out. And anything oh. that you complain about, it's, it's the same old Scientology thing. If there's any complaint, no matter how well justified, it's, it's yourself to blame. You must have done something. You must have similar overts of your own. You're pulling it in. So you can't make any complaint, even if it is valid, you're going to be sack checked. You're going to be in ethics trouble. You're going to be on heavy mess work. It does no good to complain. I mean, people have tried. That's what happens to them. One thing Scientology does that I've observed personally, they are so good at invalidating people in every possible way, imaginable. Yes. So you're mocking it up, you're pulling it in, you're going solid on it, you're creating it. <laughs> You, yeah. you have overts, you have crimes. Mm -hmm. The absolutism of the cult is we're the most ethical group on the planet. We can't do anything wrong, therefore you're the criminal. Yeah, it's exactly the how, viewpoint. How old are you when they start grooming you or expecting you to think about joining this organization? What happens? I'm not sure. I mean, I always assumed I would join the C organization just because I didn't see anything else to do. Um, that's all I saw in my life were Sea Org members. So I, I didn't really think of anything else as an option. Um, I signed my first Sea Org contract when I was nine years old at St. Hill. What does it even mean to a nine-year-old to sign a billion-year contract? It, it's below the age of consent mm -hmm. where a minor, you know, a minor cannot sign a contract. But because you grow up in it, you expect that you'll just as you get older, you'll grow into the, you'll get to go into the Sea Org. Yeah. Was it something, did you look forward to growing up and becoming a Sea Org member or was it just something you'd resigned yourself to? When I was younger, I very much looked forward to it. It looked like fun. I suppose it would to a child. You know, I look at my daughter Isabel now and, you know, in the morning he says, you know, bye Bala, daddy's going to work and, you know, they hug and kiss and she waves him goodbye. Off he goes. 
I'm sure, you know, that looks like fun to her. He gets to go and do something fun. It was the same with me and the Sea Org. Um, but then, you know, later, as I'm older, you know, four, five, six years old, it's more impressed upon you the importance of what your parents are doing. And you shouldn't try and bother them when they're working. You know, they have a duty, they're clearing the planet. And you have a duty as a child to not disrupt them from doing that. That's a, an amazing thing. So you're, what, who you are as a, a person, you're not, you're to not interfere with the higher duty of clearing the planet. Right. So in other words, leave your, stop bothering your parents for attention, affection, whatever you need. Mm-hmm. And yeah, things, this is things, you know, like saying, you know, complaining that you didn't, have enough time with them, you know, telling them, you know, because once they then dropped you off after family time, I I mean, I wouldn't want them to go, but, you know, you have to say goodbye to them again. And that was difficult, but it was impressed upon you not to do that, not by my parents, but by the nannies. Marika, it's understandable that a child wants to stay with mommy and daddy at nighttime. Mm-hmm. And so really it's a, it's a little bit soul crushing to have this little ri- ritual of separation every night. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the other aspect to it is you're not sleeping at home. You're surrounded by, you know, a couple dozen other children and there's, there's no one to look after you while you're sleeping. There's nobody in the room. There's nobody making sure that you're safe. That shows you the, you know, the lack of security. Well, not only that, but it, it shows you how little value the Church of Scientology places on children. Mm-hmm. Because children interfere with production. Yes. This one story that went around when Katie Holmes, you know, divorced Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. One of the allegations is, and, and this was just, a, you know, reported in the news, Katie wanted to get her daughter Surrey out before the church could start indoctrinating her. Mm-hmm. Do you think that could be possible or credible? Definitely. I would imagine that that's what Katie feared the most. It doesn't say much about the church, mm-hmm. does it? No. And that's why I do want to speak about it, because there are hundreds of others that can't. I mean, they're too traumatized too, or they're still connected to their parents who are in the Sea Org, and they don't want to, they don't want to get disconnected from. But I just want you to bear that in mind. You know, when some people blame, you know, blame the parents, you could see that if a parent had enough power within the organization, or if they had enough money they could make their child's life better. You know, the likes of um, Jenna Miscavige, Melissa Sutter, Benjamin Rinder, uh, you, you know, Alexander, Gents. Yes. You know, these children had much better lives than those kids in the playground. And it was because it's not that their parents cared any more or less than the parents of the playground kids, it was that their parents had power and their parents had money so that they could affect a change. So if your mother was a cleaner or maybe just um, a course administrator, you know, some lower position and had no power, well, then that was unfortunate. You were just going to live the life of the playground children. But, you know, if your mother was Biddy Miscavige um, and, you know, your father was Heba Jench, then you were going to have a much better childhood. Yes, and, and, and that raises a great question. When does that childhood stop? And the reason I ask this is that Alexander Jench was cleaning toilets at age 12 at the flag land base, mm. no education. So whatever privileges he had by age 12, he is a janitor, not in school. And he used to call 
you know, his mother and cry. Oh. He wanted he wanted to come home. And and this is something I very much want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Out on the internet there's very much at times a blame the victim mentality. Mm. And it's kind of you stupid parents, you deserve everything you get, you're to blame for your child's misfortune, you caused it. Mm-hmm. But the cruel thing, and look, the internet is merciless. It's just, that's just the way it is, okay? Mm-hmm. So when Alexander died, I don't know how many people tried to privately tell me, well, you know, it's Karen's fault. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. Can I just no, say, but it's, it's, out, it's out there, you can read it oh, online. I've never read anything like that. And if I did, uh, I'd spit on it because I knew Karen as a mother. And she was one of the best mothers out there. I mean, I had a sleepover at Alexander's house. I saw how she was with him. I mean, she was one of those doting mothers. Um, She couldn't get enough of her son, and she couldn't do enough for him. I remember, you know, she's brushing his teeth, and he's trying to watch his cartoons, which she's taped for him, by the way. I mean, how cool is that? She taped these specific cartoons that he wanted to watch. Anyway, so she's brushing his teeth while he watches his cartoons and then, you know, she's getting him to gargle and spit and following him around as he's trying to play and do things. And the amount of care that she showed him was, I mean, I've, it, it would be hard to, to, to show more care than, than she did. And well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that. It, Marika, let me put mm. some pieces together I also, for you. I, yeah. Let me put some pieces together for you, because th- this is what I figured out. Okay. And this is what's wrong with the Church of Scientology, its inherent sadism and cruelty. Mm-hmm. If a parent leaves the C organization, they may, not, they may not be able to see their child ever again. So there's, there's some emotional blackmail inherent in disconnection. Mm-hmm. The second thing I figured out, a lot of the people being cruel to my wife, Karen, when she lost her son, were OSA. It was people with the Office of Special Affairs online. That's so you get the sick. No, this this is true. You get the sick and twisted people commanded by Linda Hamill, calling Karen a bad mother, running this on her. That's terrible. Can I tell you that um, we looked forward to Alexander's birthday parties because Karen would throw such elaborate birthday parties. I mean, they were so much fun. Uh, one year, she had a ma- magician at CC. Uh, I think I even have a photo of it somewhere. Um, yeah, it's Stan. Uh, I know who you're talking about. I mean, it was so about. much fun. I mean, Heba was there. Karen was there. You know, a lot of the the um, CMO nursery children's parents were there. Um, it was such a fun birthday party. Uh, very funny ma- magician. He put these humongous glasses on me and this wig and everybody mm. was laughing. It was, it was a lot of fun. And then one year, uh, it was almost like on some farm. We had a hayride. Um, I remember we had our photo taken. We were, we were sitting on stacks of, of hay. Uh, that was a really fun birthday. I think that was one of the last actually. What was Alexander Jench like? What was your experience of him? He was a lovely boy. I can't say anything bad about him. Uh, he was very nice. He was fun. He was just a little boy. Yeah, and he was a boy who really wanted a dad. And he didn't get to see his dad very often. And that, and that really that speaks to me because... It was very much, I mean, we, we all dealt with that in the CMO nursery. Um, because I have to say, although we were somewhat privileged, you know, we got better food and an abundance of it. Um, you know, we had two nannies. We got to go to the library. Um, although, although we had that, we missed our parents more because our parents would disappear for months at a time, weeks, months. My mom would go up to Int. Uh, She had to. She would be ordered up to Int. Um, She would have to work up there. And the terrifying thing about it was 
you never knew when you were going to see her again. So I never knew when I was going to see her again. I didn't know. I mean, she would tell me, look, you know, I have to go over the rainbow. Because they could never say int. They would just they would just say over the rainbow. You didn't know where. Like, I can't even pinpoint on a map where my mother is going. You just know that she's going to be gone, and you might not see her for months or a year or whenever. Right. And she would, she would say, you know, I'll try and be back soon. And I said, but when are you coming back? I don't know. And that terrified me. And every time I had to say goodbye to her, it was terrifying. So now, you know, in... In 1988, so I'm six years old, and family time stops. There's no family time at all. Now my mother's going up to Int more often, and she's gone for weeks at a time, and that's hard. Also, my dad got RPF'd. He got put on the Rehabilitation Project Force in, um, I believe in, in 1988 for just over a year so yeah Hayden got put on the RPF um, is it a is it a, a social stigma for a child if your parent is on the RPF or how do they tell you that your dad is locked up well my mom told me um, conditions were slightly better back then uh, he would come home uh, one evening a week and I would sometimes see him at lunchtime too. They had their lunchtime at a different time to everybody else, but I would be allowed to go and sit with him. He was mm. with the other RPFers, and I would I would sit with him and have lunch. That was a couple times. But I would see him at least once a week, but it was still, there was a shame to it. And was, it a fa was it a family shame that you and your mother had to bear? Yes, very much so. And we were devastated by it. And I didn't really fully understand it. I didn't blame my father at all. I don't think I blamed anybody. I just felt bad that he had to be there. And that he was made to be in that position where he was lower than everybody else. One of my... But, it, mm -hmm. but it's such a striking contrast to life outside of the Church of Scientology. Mm-hmm. And the only possible parallel I can think is, is uh, I knew someone when I was a, a child, maybe eight or nine, their father was arrested and convicted for a crime, and he, he went to prison. Okay. And, you know, it was something like bank robbery. It was a pretty serious felony. And everyone knew that Johnny, Johnny's dad was in prison. Mm -hmm. And it was so shocking. We didn't look down on him, but it, it was like, your dad is in prison for a long time, and he knew he wouldn't see his dad again. And and I'm sure it it I mean it devastated the kid because his dad I mean he his dad went away for like 20 years. Oh gosh. And now when you're in a church structure, mm -hmm. the most ethical beings on the planet, clearing the planet, and your dad gets RPF'd, do the other kids treat you differently? Do they do they make fun of you, or is is it very serious? How's it treated within? Uh, the group you're in of other kids. No, it's very serious. It's just considered um, that that's, I mean, it's just what it is. Uh, nobody made fun of me for it. Um, but they knew your, your dad was getting punished for, because that's a culture of punishment in yes. the church. Yes. I mean, I guess it's, you knew he did something wrong. You don't know what hmm. it was. But it was bad enough to be on the RPF. I mean, you knew the RPF was a bad place to be. Did it make you feel even more powerless than you already felt? Definitely. Definitely. Because at this stage, you know, he's not living with us. You know, I, I do get to see him once a week. He does come home once a week. But I, you know, he's not he's not living with us. So it feels like he's not a part of our family. But... You know, he's still my dad, but I don't really know what to think. And then at this point, my mom's taking trips up to Int. Um, so that's that's awkward, too, because sometimes there are no parents. No, the understanding would be that the church gives and takes. 
the church is all you know, and it can take your parents away at any time for any reason. Mm -hmm. So you really have no security. No, and that I was very insecure actually, and I, I, I would, I would suffer from anxiety, you know, regarding my mother going away, um, having to say goodbye to her. It was. I was very anxious about it. I, I thought about her a lot when she wasn't around. You know, it, it interrupted my day-to-day -day activities. I'd wonder where she was. I'd wonder when she was coming back. I'd wonder what she was doing, how she was doing. I just didn't know. And there was no way to know. It's not like you could ask somebody. It's not like I could say to my nanny, when's my mom coming? She would never know. But... You know, this was the life of a CMO nursery kid, and other children put up with it the same way as I did. Um, I mean, sometimes if your mom was gone long enough, they'd usually write you a letter, and it was quite common. Uh, you, you'd get your letter. Uh, it would come in the CEO post, and um, it, quite commonly what the mothers would do is put a stick of gum, uh, pa like tape a stick of gum to a piece of paper and then like use it as a tree trunk and draw the leaves and branches around it. I guess because, you know, they were in the middle of the desert, it's not like they could go and buy their child a present or anything like that. Um, but they wanted you to have something. Yes. So That's that very was, touching. it was, if you got a stick of gum, it was pretty cool. Now, could you write your, your mother letters? I guess so. I mean, it was never really encouraged. I never really Did thought you, about it. Now, Marika, there's a, a thing in the, in the uh, Church of Scientology called No Case on Post. Mm. Uh, you know, no H-E-N-R, no human emotion reaction. Is that pushed on children? Yes. I mean, are you? You're, you're, it sounds like you're forced to grow up at a very young age because you don't really have a childhood. Right. And you really don't have parents. So what was your, what's your identity at that point? Are you a Scientologist? Are you in the church? Or what, what's your fundamental identity? If, if someone asks seven or eight-year-old Marika, who are you, what would you say? I would have said I'm a Sea Org member. In fact, I did say something along those lines once. Um, if we fast forward to, it's 1990 now. So yeah, I've just turned eight years old. My dad's off the RPF. My brother's living with us again. Um, my mother's up at Int. Now what had happened was, uh, we lived in a building, in a, an apartment building called the Edgemont Building. What happened was a boy that lived in the Edgemont building got shot. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's here, in Los that's here in Los Angeles on Edgemont? Yeah. And he shot, who shot him? I don't know the specifics. I just know that he was shot. Um, my mother was up at Int at the time. Uh, she'd been gone for weeks. And was, the, was the boy killed? Not that I know of. But he was shot with a gun. He was shot with a gun. And he was in the hospital. Um, my mother was up at Int and she'd heard the story. Somebody said, oh gosh, did you hear? And she said, no. And they said, well, a kid was shot at the, Edge, uh, at the Edgemont building. Well, she immediately freaked out because both her children live at the Edgemont building. Yeah, she thinks, okay, so, you know, I'm sure they'd tell me if it was my kid, but still she's worried. Any parent would be. Yeah, she was very worried and she wanted to check and see if I was okay. But of course, that's not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. And you're not allowed to have case on post. And children come last. So here's the funny thing. She said she had a doctor's appointment. Now, she couldn't get permission to come and visit me, but she could get a doctor's right. appointment. So she says she has a doctor's appointment. And she leaves the imp base. And she comes to see me at the CEO. 
but I'm not there. We've gone to the library. So she goes to the library, and we're not there. And then she comes to the Edgemont building, because now this is where we go in the evening. Before I turn up, security turns up. And my dad is with them. And security, and my mom says, look, I just want to make sure my kids are okay. And security says, yeah, no, no, it's fine. We understand. You know, you just have to report back to in. And everything's fine. Just, you just got to go back. Really, so, so a child's been shot. Your mother's obviously panicked and worried. Mm -hmm. And they tell her, uh, everything's fine. Get back on post. Yeah. Th and that is so wrong on so many levels. I know. And she never did get to see me. So she reported back to Int. And as soon as she got there, she was told that she had violated policy and she had blown. And they said she had to do the RPF. For wanting to check on you? Yes. So was she, did she get RPF? She did. She got, she got put on the RPF and she said, look, she said, my husband is at PAC, which is in LA. My, my husband's in LA. My daughter and my son are in LA. Um, I want to do the RPF in LA. At least then I'll, I'll get to see my children. And they agreed. They said, yeah, but we have to just route you on at INT, and then we'll transfer you to LA. So she agreed. And as soon as she was routed on at INT, they said, no, you can't go to PAC. You can't go to LA. You have to do your RPF here at INT. And this is, has to be ridiculous to you as a child. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's happening way above your head. You, know, you have no control over it. I don't. Your dad, your dad just got out of RPF. When did you learn your mom had been RPF'd? Well, here was the thing. So I just turned eight years old, and I got a phone call from my mom. And, you know, she said, happy birthday. And she told me that she'd been RPF'd. And I couldn't believe it. I said, no, it's shocking. I said, Mom, what did you do? You know, it must have been something so horrific to have been RPF'd. I was worried for her. Um, and I was wondering when I was going to see her again. Um, but... My biological father, John, he had invited uh, me and my brother to come and visit for my eighth birthday. So my mom uh, came from in and put us on the plane. Obviously, if anyone else could have done it, they would have done it. But legally, she was the only, buddy, the only one that could. So she put us on the plane. And I got to... Uh, I went to Louisiana to my dad, John's house. He had a ranch there. And, you know, eventually, you know, he started asking questions, you know, about my life and how I was doing there. And, you know, my brother was older and he was more outspoken and he'd had half of his life away from, Sciento from Scientology and the Sea Org and half of it in. So he could see differences and... I never could. That was all I knew. Um, so he voiced concerns to my dad. And my dad asked me about things, you know, how things were going. And when he found out my mom was on the RPF, he did not want me to return. He was worried mm. about who was going to look after me. So um, he wouldn't let me go back. And he, you know, he, he basically made a really big stink about it. How I, I could understand, I would. Yeah. And so I stayed now at John's for a couple months waiting to go back. Uh, the thing is, with my mom being on the RPF, it's, it's really hard to get a call in. You can't call somebody who's on the RPF. So 
I'm in a situation where I'm eight years old. I'm stuck in Louisiana. I'm just trying to get home. And I'm just patiently waiting. I mean, I told John that I wanted to be with my mom. You know, he was trying to make it nice and comfortable for me to live there. And it was nice. You know, he bought me a bike. He taught me how to ride my bike. You know, we had horses and ducks and chickens and it was fun. It was, it would have been a nice childhood, but I could not live it without my mother. Yeah, and that shows the power of love. I mean, you, you want to be with your mother mm -hmm. and your, uh, your father who's raised you, Hayden. Mm -hmm. And so you want to get back. You're caught between worlds. You're in a non-Scientology world, and the people you love are inside the church. Right. And you can't call your mother because she's locked up in the Scientology jail, mm -hmm. which doesn't have visiting hours. No. And the, yeah. the in like, base is the is the worst place to do your RPF because it's so secluded from anywhere. Yeah, and I just want to make the point, and, and even in prison, you could have visitors. You could have phone calls, letters. Mm -hmm. But not Scientology. It's worse than a prison. Mm. And uh, so what happened? How did you get so back home? Eventually, my mom manages to get uh, to get to the phone and call my dad. And he was... So John, um, and he and he was pretty pissed, you know. He let her know that he wasn't happy with the conditions with her being on the RPF and this, that, and the other. Anyway, they eventually talked it out. Um, and you know, he also knew that I really wanted to be with my mom, and I think you know he was trying to do right by me and my mom. Um, so he agreed that I could go back, and I was at this point. You know, really, uh, I really wanted to make sure that I got back and I got back fast. Um, you know, John said that he had to go to the ticket place and there was a problem with the ticket and he'd have to figure it all out. And I said, that's okay, Dad, I'll come with you. And he was like, well, you know, no, it's, it's you know, let me just figure this out. But I was like, no, I, I was going to see this done and now as fast as possible sure so within the next day or two this was also the um the difficult thing for me was was leaving my brother again too uh you know from the age of two i had you know he would go away and be with our dad John and then he'd come back for a little bit and go away for a little bit and you know I was used to him being gone a couple times but it was it was incredibly hard for me and he had decided he was not coming back to the Sea Org uh, he didn't like it he didn't like the way that children were treated and he wasn't coming back so I had to go back by myself and that was tough yeah especially when you're eight years old you you go back into that kind of world. Yeah. And, and that's a defining moment in your life. Very much so. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was tough. So I land at the airport. And, you know, again, they've allowed my mom out so that she can come and pick me up. And... She was just devastated. She asked where my brother was. And I had to explain that he wasn't coming back. How did your mom take it? She was in tears. Mom's going to have to go back on RPF. Right. Her son's not coming back. And she's going to have to put you back back where you were. Yes. And Scientology, their PR people like to say they don't break up families or practice disconnection. And yet, 
seemingly all they do, particularly at the level of Sea Org, is to break up families, disconnect, and it's a place of great sorrow, especially for a child. It is. So what and, what happens <clears throat> next? Does your does your mother have to take you back to the pack base? Right. So now I'm. So now she takes me back to the CEO. I'm in the CMO nursery. She goes back up to Int. Um, my dad Hayden is now at Int, so I'm alone in LA. You have to be feeling emotionally numb. Do you shut down in some way? I mean, what does a child do with these overwhelmingly overwhelming sorrow and grief? What do you do? I don't know. I just think it's so normal at this stage. It's so part of life. You know, I've had a couple of years where my mother disappears for months at a time. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. I mean, this is just another another part of that. And you're a child. You don't, you don't have, obviously, you can't support yourself. You can't leave. You can't make it better. You just have to accept it the way it is. Yeah, and I never, I was not really aware that there was another way. I mean, what we were doing, I mean, we were saving the world. There's nothing, there's nothing better than that. And but look at the cost. I mean, look at the cost of saving the world. It's complete grief, breaking up a family, no family time. Right, and that's the, that's the ultimate betrayal because there are hundreds of children out there that sacrifice their childhood so their parents could save the world. And there's hundreds of parents out there that sacrificed, you know, the family life and, and bringing up their children so that they could save the world and make the world a better place for the child to grow up in. And, and you look, 30 years later, I mean, what's the Sea Org done? What's Scientology done? Do you see it making a difference in the world? It's a mockery. That's worse than a mockery. Marika, look at this. It, not only is it not clearing the planet, it is accumulating billions of dollars at the expense of broken people, yeah. families, families, children like you, to accumulate billions of dollars. And for what? Is it so that you can build nuclear-proof vaults to store the technology in against doomsday? That's not even a product. Mm. It's one of those things, these children who are crying out, who need parenting, nutrition, food, medical care, education, everything that a normal child can have. They're doing this and calling it planetary clearing while they're putting parents in RPF, mm. to breaking up mother and daughter, you know, father and son. Mm. Of course they're not clearing the planet. And, and yet people in the Sea Org most of them are very inherently decent people mm. who thought they wanted to make a difference. And you, even as a child, you had this decent sense that, well, maybe I have to sacrifice to help my mom and dad. Right. Exactly. So now I'm in a place where I'm in L.A. by myself. I don't even have my parents. They're up at Int. Um, I believe at this stage my mother gets reprieved from the RPF. Um, so she was... She was only on for a couple of months, I think. Um, so now she's back on post. Um, and it's terrible that she should even be on for a few months or your dad for a year. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the points that the Church of Scientology doesn't understand. No matter how they try to PR it or sell it, look, this is horrible when a church attorney or a church spokesman tries to say, these people are entering a rehabilitation program voluntarily. No, they're not. Even though they sign a contract mm -hmm. at some non Look, all these non-Scientology attorneys are taking blood money to, to perpetuate human suffering in a legal manner. Mm. These lawyers are the real dark shadow men behind it. No one enters RPF voluntarily. They do it because they have no options. They'll either be disconnected from their entire family, never see their kids or their spouse, 
maybe if they're lucky, they get 500 bucks and told to hit the bricks. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality. And no matter what the church says about how voluntary RPF is, it's not. It's a very cruel thought reform prison camp. Mm -hmm. And your parents went through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad was different after it. How was he different? Um, he seemed tense. Uh, he seemed worried. He just seemed like he wasn't as easygoing as he was. And, and no, I guess when you, you get out of a thought reform camp, a very fascist style thought reform camp like a gulag, mm -hmm. you know that if you slip up again, you could be put back in the prison interrogated for hundreds or thousands of hours for some endless period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of it. But so he he comes out, so around 91, both your parents well, are out of RPF? Well, this, is, family... this is still 1990, and, and okay. it's, um, I'm going to say it's around August now. Uh, and so... Now the CEO has been disbanded. The cadet org has been disbanded. Um, this no kids policy is very much in effect right now. Um, well, let's back up for a minute. No children in Sea Org was implemented, you said, around 1986? That's when the policy first came out, yeah. But by 1990, it's in effect. Very much so. You know, now women are being, um, I mean, couples are being shipped out to class five orgs to work on garrison until their children are old enough so that they can return to the Sea Org. And for Scientology watchers, the policy that came out in 90, 1986 basically says Sea Org members can't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. If they do, they're shipped off to a failing org. Yes. It's a failing class five org until the child is six years old. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then you, have, then you have to reapply to go back into Sea Org. Mm -hmm. The alternative is to have an abortion. Right. Or you could become a baby boomer and just leave the organization completely. Now, what does that mean? Is that like being PTS in the middle class? It, I mean, does a baby boomer, is that an insult from the church? Very much so. What does it mean when they call you a baby boomer, that you're going to sell out? A baby boomer means um, you means that you, know, you decided to have children instead of doing your post. I have never heard this term, Marika, oh, yeah. and I'm always shocked. So a baby boomer, it, it's used derisively. Mm -hmm. Typically so wanna, towards women but it could be used towards a couple. Mm -hmm. And again, this goes to the culture of cruelty. So this is some glib term. Instead of clearing the planet, you're a baby boomer. Right. At you want to have a kid, so get out of here. Yeah, and I've even heard it. Um, I, I even heard a boy call his own mother a baby boomer once. Uh, he, was, he was a young boy in the Sea Org. He was a tech page. Um, like a, a folder page, I think. Yes. And um, I was having some auditing. And he said something, and I said, oh, you were a Sea Org kid. And he said, well, yeah, I was. And then my mom left the Sea Org and became a baby boomer. So she got pregnant and then left the Sea Org. She didn't go to a Class 5 org and work on garrison and then return. She left the organization completely and decided to raise her children. And I, so she's a, she's a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. Marika, is it, when you leave the Sea Org, you're viewed as a degraded being, are you not? Very much so. So a baby boomer is boomer's just a degraded being. Yeah, and even worse because it's, it's like you decide to do that. You know, some people are aberrated and, you know, maybe can't help some of their decisions or aren't good enough for the Sea Org, but baby boomers have decided that rearing children is more important than clearing the planet. And yet the Church of Scientology blathers on and on about how it's pro-family, mm. when it has nothing to do with family whatsoever. And jumping around a little bit, I know people 
public members of the Church of Scientology, OTs, who actually went out of their way and even risked be, being declared suppressive persons to keep their children out of the clutches of Sea Org recruiters. Mm. Yeah. And the Sea Org recruiters trying to undercut mom and dad to get the kid. Mm -hmm. You know, mom yeah, and dad happens. are counterintention, CI, enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens. I mean, I had first-hand experience of that as a SEAL recruitment officer at the age of 16. Um, it was my job to recruit people, and I would be handed files of, you know, personnel files and told, you know, these are your prospects. These are prospective people to recruit. And I, w I went through them. I made a phone call. I knew one of the boys. He was about my age. And he went to one of the Scientology schools, Greenfields. So I called the telephone number, um, and his mother answered. And I explained who I was, and she was like, you know, you're not trying to recruit him, are you? And I was like, no, no, I'm just a friend, just calling to say hi. <laughs> and she just, you know, went on a roll and just gave me a whole speech about he was not to be recruited, um, you know. In which, which the Sea Org ignores that. Oh, completely. Oh, yeah, and, they don't uh, care. They, it, they handle him, and then when he gets that fire in his eye and decides that it's the greatest good to give up everything and join the Sea Org, and it's now his job to convince his mother. It's not your job to convince her. He's got to do that, and, and of course he will, because it's what he desperately wants. Yeah, and so he gets mom and dad or if he's you know has a single parent he'll get them to sign the paper mm -hmm. and again this is where the lawyers are at work get them to sign a legal paper saying that you you at 16 year old have parental consent to drop out of school and join the sea org and every step of the way they really try to cover themselves legally because the church of scientology is terrified of being sued and exposed in the courts of law or worse having you know criminal cases filed against them mm -hmm. And it's so criminal, it's so anti-family, anti-life. Marika, there's an interesting word. You, I, when I was, it's a word from the Latin. It's called opus con naturum, which means a work contrary to nature. Mm. Does the Sea Org feel that way to you, that it's a work fundamentally contrary to nature? Oh, completely. In, in every it, aspect, almost. And when you hear... Scientologists defending the Sea Org. What do you think, having lived through that hell? <laughs> what do I think? I think. Um, yeah. I think I remember when I used to defend it too. That's also another thing. You're not. You're not allowed to think of it negatively. Um, you know, I was a child growing up in the Sea Org, and then you know later I was a public Scientologist, but never at any point was I allowed to think that that. That, that time in the CEO was a bad time. I mean, I was privileged. That's how people thought of it. I was lucky to grow up in the Sea Org because, you know, here I was being treated correctly because I'm a, I'm a Thetan, just in a little body. So they're treating me uh, better than any WOG would treat me. And with all the LRH policies, about children and with Scientology being applied to me. I mean, I knew people who they found out what my childhood was like or, or that I had a, a Sea Org childhood. They were, oh my gosh, oh you lucky thing. I wish I had that. I didn't, you know, I had parents who didn't understand me. I had this, I had that, but aren't you so lucky? And for the most part, they didn't really have a clue what it actually entailed, but that was the viewpoint, and I dare not think any other way. Marika, that point is so fundamental. The more interviews I do, the more I realize there's an inherent disconnect between Scientology publics and Scientology Sea Org members. Oh, very much so, yes. My, yeah, and my feeling is that they live in completely different universes. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example. And, and they don't understand each other. And here's a perfect example. At FLAG, the whole goal is in the Sea Org is to raise money mm -hmm. from Publix, take out $150,000. And I had a former Sea Org member tell me, among the regs, it's a game to get that money. 
Mm. But you know, when they when they when they get one hundred fifty thousand dollars from someone on a credit card or a second home loan, they don't have to pay back that one hundred fifty thousand dollars. A Sea Org member has no reality on money, none, because they get so little and they have so little, and yet they can take it. And there's no reality; it's monopoly money. That's very. On the true. other hand. Yeah, and on the other hand, the public has no reality on the suffering a Sea Org member goes through. And let me give you an example. We were talking before the show. People on, on my show have mentioned uh, uniform parts, right? Mm. A Sea Org member has uniform parts, pants and shirt. You told me that all the Sea Org issues you are just the outer parts. Mm -hmm. In other words, they don't give you undergarments or socks or shoes. Or shoes, right. Now, wait a minute. This, this is a, a group that has $1.5 billion in cash on paper and more, and they won't buy you shoes, socks, or underclothes. Like, how does it, how does it even work? And so the publics don't get this. Or they would go buy Sea Org members' clothes and help them out financially. They would just get, if I were a public Scientologist, I would just give my money to Sea Org members and not to the church. Mm to try to help them out because at this point the church has plenty of money. It doesn't need any more. It's not, it's hoarding the money it has. And Sea Org members have to buy their own shoes on what? $6 a week. If it's, you know, a quarter pay week. Mm -hmm. Add shampoo and conditioner and shaving foam and razors. And yeah. And women have to buy feminine hygiene products. Right. The Sea Org won't even buy the basic hygiene items. A person needs toothpaste, soap, shampoo. Mm hmm. They won't buy them shoes. No. They'll give you some uniform parts that may or may not fit. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and yet, the indoctrination is such that you, you Sea Org members feel they are part of the elite group clearing the planet. Yeah, very much so. That's the delusion, is that you're, you're lucky. You're privileged to be in this position. When Tom Cruise did his video when he said, I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist. Mm. When you saw that, what did you think when Tom was putting it that way? Well, it was a little different for me because I saw it after the fact. Um, I hadn't been to the event and seen that one. I missed that years. But what I'm saying is you can see it from both sides. You yeah. can understand what Tom Cruise is saying. Oh, I and completely why he understand saying it. what he's saying. I mean, it's in the culture. It's in the culture to be better than non-Scientologists. And there's a hierarchy. Um, you know, first is the public, then it's the staff, and then it's the Sea Org members. And then within those, that tier, there's, there's positions themselves. You know, within the Sea Org. Yeah, and even, even within the public. You know, you could be a public Scientologist, but you could be an FSM. You could be a field staff member. Um, and what you're essentially doing is, you know, helping people get up the bridge. Um, you know, maybe they talk to you and say, oh, gosh, you know, things aren't going too well with my finances. You know, and you say, oh, you'd be doing so much better if you did grade two. You know, fork out 30 grand and do grade two and then you'll be doing a lot better. And they go, oh, okay, I think I'll do that. Take your advice, do that. As a, as a field staff member, you get 10% of that, 30 grand. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you, you ask them to open a flow, mm -hmm. which means donate money. But yet you're getting a commission for doing that. By the way, no other churches really have a commission s system for their field salespeople because they don't have field salespeople. Mm. They have evangelists, you know, who will oh. generally give you a free Bible, a free Quran, a free copy of the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. whatever their holy book is. Mm -hmm. And I think it's extraordinary. We just heard uh, Tony Ortega just post a church PR, Sylvia Stenard. Mm -hmm. You know, she was talking at that religious conference, Chautauqua. That's right. And she was saying, you know, get a book, read it, decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, why don't you just give them a book, mm. give out free books out of your, you know, but, generosity. And then they, and worse, they had a shill, another uh, Scientologist in the audience who said, well, you should do the ups and downs courses for, it's only 150. Oh, that's ridiculous. I thought, if it's so good, why don't you give it away? Why does it have to only be 150? Why doesn't it only be free? Mm -hmm. 
but they can't give it away for free because Ellerich says the person has to buy the book because if they don't buy the book, then they don't value it. <laughs> no, they're not allowed to because no, I... it's going to be out exchange and then they won't value Scientology. They have to buy Look, it. If, if I'm running a business, I will not give anything away or I'll go out of business. <laughs> but if I'm running uh, what I believe to be offering the truth about God or the universe or whatever, you can have a copy of the book. Now, if you join my group, maybe you should donate 10%. That seems to be historically a good number, get 10%, right? Oh my gosh, I have to just say, yeah. my ex-fiance, Mark, he, he he's a Scientologist. He um, He would always go on about that. You know, 10%. Like, they only give 10% of their earnings to their church. Like, we should join that church. <laughs> he would say it jokingly, but he was just like, because I guess some people would say in outrage, like, oh, did you know the Mormons have to give 10% or the Jehovah's Witnesses or, or whoever it is that, you know, gives 10% and, and they have to. Um, I mean, he would have loved to have only given 10% of his income. Well, that, that's uh, you make a great point. In the Bible, there's a, a ten percent. You know, so the God of the Bible, he only wants ten percent, right? Mm -hmm. Not greedy. And you can give above that if you know you feel blessed. And I grew up in the Christian tradition where ten percent was expected, and you can live with that. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, it builds empires like uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is built upon ten percent. Mm -hmm. It's built itself into a very good church if if you want to be a religious person and it has a university and it takes mm -hmm. care of its or and so on well it's very family oriented it is absolutely family oriented in fact it wants you to have many children mm -hmm. eight or ten children and if you don't make enough money you need to as they say lengthen your stride brother and make more money so your wife can have more children so you can build your celestial kingdom. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, and I don't have any criticism of that because they feed their children, they clothe them, they educate them, they cherish them, they believe children are a gift from God, a blessing from God, and I do too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, most people believe that, children are a blessing from God. And they'll drive you crazy at times, <laughs> sure, but they're a blessing. Yes. So on the other hand, the Church of Scientology, it wants all of your money, not 10% like the God of the Bible, it wants 90 or 100 percent. Lately, the, the talk has been in the church, uh, go all in, meaning give everything. Yeah, it's disgusting. It, it is. It's truly disgusting. Ugh. Like, on top of all your money, they want your children. Mm -hmm. They want your children for the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, the end phenomena, the EP of the Church of Scientology, is nothing left of a person. They will literally suck the bone marrow out of your bones, and then there's nothing left of you. Well, they will strip your dynamics. They will they will make sure you have no life. I have not heard that term, strip your dynamics. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? Explain. I, I don't know. It's just something I thought of. But that is a great term, though. Mm -hmm. Strip your dynamics. Yeah, they'll they strip, will your, strip your dynamics. Because if you think about it, um, you know, your dynamics, these eight compartments which comprise life, um, they will take away each one until you're left with nothing that's your life gone yeah there's nothing left so your first person. dynamic you know that's you your individual self there's no individual self there and you have no time to yourself or for yourself as a public Scientologist as a staff member as a CEO member it's just gone the second dynamic that's got to be a joke um, so there's no second dynamic you know the only group dynamic you have is this blood-sucking group, Scientology. You got the third dynamic, the group. Mm. So yeah, it will strip you of your dynamics. That's very well said. Marika, with that, we're going to uh, wind up for right now. I okay. want to have you back. Okay. I think this is really fascinating. It's painful. Yeah. I'm glad you have the courage to share it because not everyone does. Oh, you're right. It's it's very painful and difficult. And for people who are still in the church, you should value your children. Never choose the church over your children or your family. If they give you that kind of choice, don't take it. It's a really bad choice. What would you say to people still in the church, Marika? 
Um, I would say do what makes you happy. Make decisions in your life that will make you happy because that is the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. That's very sensible advice. Do what makes you happy. And it's so contrary to anything Scientology teaches. Yeah, it's not and, don't do the supposed to's or what you should do because those are all lies. But if if the person actually followed their heart and did what, what they felt was right, not that what they were told was right, then that's what's correct for that person. And they would be happy. I appreciate those words. And they come from bitter experience. When, when we do our next part, Marika, I'd like to go through from 1990 forward. Mm. Because we just have a lot more to talk about. Definitely, yeah. We can talk about... And the the int base, uh, sorry, the int ranch, and that that was yeah interesting. Time. We'll, okay, we'll talk about that next time. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com or on YouTube. Just put in Surviving Scientology Radio. We're also available on iTunes, where we dominate the search word as Scientology. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.